So thanks to Mike and Mike and Crystal and Cross Campus for having me. Uh, so here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna give you a very quick two minutes about me so you can decide whether you wanna listen or not. And then we're gonna go straight into networking uh, tricks and traps, specifically focused on how to meet and interact with investors. So the very quick two minutes on me, as Mike said, been practicing venture law for 25 years. Uh, at some big firms, did six billion with the worth of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, work a lot with first time entrepreneurs. Was on the board at the LA Venture Association and their president for two years. Uh, on the board for seven. And the LA Venture Association is a trade organization specifically designed for folks like you that would like to learn and get a chance to meet investors. So that's going to be one of your first pit stops as you think about how to find investment for your company. At Lava, we teach a first-time entrepreneur program. This is the sexy stuff, how do I find money? The eat your broccoli stuff is... What's a cap table? How do you figure out dilution when we sell stock? What's the difference between a trademark and a patent? Those are all things that we teach in our first time entrepreneur program. Next one's coming up September 16th. We have room for 25. We'd we'll be happy to see some familiar faces there. I also teach venture law at Loyola Law School. So I can do the graduate version or the simple version, whatever you need. Uh, and enjoy the book. It's in English, not legalese. Bite-sized chapters. You can read it on a plane or over the weekend. Hope you enjoy it. If you like the book, I would love a review on Amazon. Uh, that being said, let's let's go ahead and get into the program. Uh, so the elevator pitches here were actually pretty good. Uh, normally, I start out with the all-time worst elevator pitch I've I've heard in my career. Uh, or as Trump would say, that the world has ever seen. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the, I went to a meetup, and it was much smaller than this. There were six people, and there was a guy who looked like he was a PhD. And I, I walked up to him, and I said, so what do you do? And he looked at me, looked down, looked up, and said, I'd tell you, but you wouldn't understand. <laughs> so y'all did better than that. So that's pretty good. The, the second worst one I ever saw was this lady was uh, working on uh, a water product, nothing like yours, uh, and decided that Disney was the right target. She stalked the guy who was the head of uh, product placement at the Disney parks and walked up to the guy and stuffed a package in his hand and said, I have this great product and you need to look at this. And he literally let it drop to the floor. He said, I can't take that from you. I would have to get an NDA. You know, I, I don't want any record that we've agreed to do anything with you. You can't do that to people. So don't do that. Uh, so I'm gonna try and teach you things like that. Uh, so the the cleanest uh, elevator pitch, the reason they call it an elevator pitch, is the idea is to get in and out and do something memorable. So our friend with the water company, that was pretty clean, pretty quick. It was funny and it got people's attention. I understand immediately what you do. Um, yours was good, it was a little long. So what you have to think is, I literally have this guy in the elevator for five floors. So I wanna get him to get off the elevator. And if I keep talking and I'm on floor 10 and he got off on floor five, I fail. So you wanna short hit the, the, the product that you're doing is absolutely fascinating and something we need, so good pitch. Uh, so getting past pitches, I'm a guy, so I always think about things in terms of sports. I'm going to try to behave myself, but when I think about going out to raise money, I think about pre-game preparation, what you do during the game, and what you do after the game is over. So for you, as you're going on your adventure, you need to think about before you start racing off to pitch competitions and uh, VC panels and other things where you want to go jump people and physically assault them to get money, you need to think about what's your, what's your proposition? What events do you need to go to and why are you going to those events? Which, that last one seems obvious, it's not. Uh, so the first thing you have to understand is why, why are you doing your startup? Why does someone want to invest in you? And I'm only going to spend a minute on this. There's more in the book about it. 
But if the idea is you're going to walk up to someone and say, I need a million dollars because I want to quit my day job and do X, the investor went deaf when you said, I want to quit my day job. No, no one wants to support your lifestyle business. Sorry. They just don't. The investor is in it for the investor. And part of the book talks about you need to think about like not from your perspective, but from the investor's perspective. The investor is probably someone who has money. They like Chevron. Chevron stock is awesome. It goes up 10% every year no matter how much oil they spill in the Gulf. And the damn thing pays you a dividend to hold it. So how cool is that? So Or I can invest in your company. You have no prototype. You sort of have an idea. You have no co-founders and you're a dentist trying to do an app. No, no, not doing that. Unless, unless you tell me it's gonna guarantee me a 100% return in the first three months, and then I, I don't believe you, but I'd like to hear more. So you have to think about what's in it for the investor. And if you have a lifestyle company where, you know, I wanna open a car wash and I wanna run it the next 40 years, no, I, I wanna be able to get my money back, not fund your lifestyle. So you have to think about what is this pitch and why, why does the investor want a taste of this deal? So that's mission one. Second thing is to figure out where, where are the investors at? Where are the watering holes? So uh, going to a VC panel is interesting. Uh, obviously there will be at least a couple investors on the stage, but there probably won't be any more investors in the crowd because they already know those guys. Uh, if you go to a fast pitch competition, and for those that are really new to the process, there are events like this, there's a meetup, there's a speaker. Um, these are great events to go to. Investors will sometimes show up at these. More importantly, you heard some financial advisors, you heard some marketing experts, there's a, an executive coach that I met. Those people, by two or three degrees of separation, also know investors. So you want to get to know those folks. Uh, but a fast pitch competition is one where there may be a prize and 10 companies get to come up on the stage and they do a presentation, hopefully in front of investors and not just lawyers and accountants. Uh, but then they, they get a chance to structure stuff. Um, so events like that are, are good for you. Uh, what I always tell people is you want to go to an event based on who's in the room, not who the speaker is unless it's me. Um, so as an example, there's a group called the Association for Corporate Growth. They're way past where you are. They're, they're middle market companies. So if I see you at an ACG event, I'm going to encourage you to go home and go work on your project because it's, it's, there will be no investors for you there. But the reason I bring it up is they bring in rock stars. They've got Richard Branson coming to speak. They've got the former president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, Michael Eisner from Disney. And if the idea is you're gonna to go to that event because you wanna see Michael Eisner, how many people think you're networking? Oh, right? You're, you're going to hear something, you're not meeting anybody. It doesn't matter who the speaker is in an, at an event if there are going to be people you need to meet. So those are the events you should go to. If you are a mobile gaming company, you should be going to the mobile interest group at the LA Venture Association. There will be other companies there, there will be advisors that know investors there, and there might be mobile app investors at that meeting. Uh, same thing with Innovate Pasadena. If there's an event on something in your industry, then you gotta go. And it's not to hear the speaker. So when I talk about the pregame prep, the idea of going to the event is, you're there to network. If the door opens at 6.45, you should be there at 6.44. And you should make a point of meeting everybody. So I fell victim to this. I spent time talking to Angela, my junior lawyer, who's been coming to these events uh, pretty regularly. So a lot of you probably recognize her. But when I talk to Angela at a networking event, I am not networking. I don't even know her. So I want to know you. So I need to make sure that I'm meeting everyone in the room. And you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing. And you may think, well, I'm a startup, I have no money, that's why I'm here. Why am I talking to the financial advisor people? I, I have no money to invest with you. But she might know somebody, and Henry might know somebody. So you wanna to talk to everybody at the event. And you wanna use the morning or the, the before the panel time to network your butt off. And then after the panel, 
you know, lawyers and accountants are notorious for this. We go to an education event, the panel is on at 8, the doors open at 7.30, so we show up at 8.01, sit there bored out of our minds. The panel ends at 8.45 and we're all racing to the parking lot to beat each other out of there. No, be the last one out of here today, if you can afford to do it. Because you're gonna use that time after I'm done yapping to meet each other and hopefully meet somebody that might be able to help your business. That is networking. So when you're looking for events, we're picking events where there might be people that are useful to you. It could be the speaker, but we don't really care. And we wanna maximize our time before and after the event. That's really important. When you're at the, before you go to the event, another thing to do to help yourself out so LAVA has a VC panel like most organizations, and they usually do it in August. I think this year it's in September. And the VCs hate it. We, we make five of them come on the stage, and they're all angry, saying, we have too many of us on the stage, we should only have two. And it's like, no, 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 you don't understand. No one wants to hear a thing you have to say. What they're doing is they're tying their track shoes and getting your cleats on so you can rush the stage as soon as you're done to stuff the business card in your hand. So the more of you that are up on the stage, the more people that will come, the more people that will get help from you, not your advice. So if, if that's your strategy, you're gonna to go to an event to meet the speaker, understand, unless you're sitting where Kate is sitting, you're gonna to need to either have really good track shoes or you're gonna to need to be very patient because you're gonna be waiting in line with 20 people or you cheat. It's kind of funny for a lawyer to say this, but I'm a huge fan of cheating. So, uh, not in law, but in other things. So, what I would do before I went to a VC panel is I would go on the organization's website and look to see who the officers and directors are and who the executive director is. So, for an event like this, if these guys have VCs on here, I want to know both mics. I want to make sure I know their names, I know their backgrounds, and I'm going to talk to them as soon as the doors open because I want them to know me and I want them to help personally introduce me to the VC that's me. So now I get ahead of all of them. Or I get a personal introduction, which is way more powerful than being number 15 in the line with yet another brochure or tablet that I have to look at. So think about, as your pregame show, who can help you at this event to meet people? And it's also good to know a Mike and Mike because regardless of who the speaker is, You'd also like to know, you know, there's a, a sea of 150 people here. If I'm my, my friend with the water company, and I want to talk to Mike and Mike to ask, anybody interested in the room this morning that I ought to know? Because they'll have looked at the list. They'll have a pretty good idea of who's coming through and what companies are here. And if it just turns out that the VC that invests in water companies is here, wouldn't you feel bad that you hadn't talked to the two people that organized the thing? So, you know, think, think about how you can, no pun intended, prime the pump. Uh, Trump invented that phrase. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can prime the pump and help yourself out uh, by maximizing the event. So that's one thing you can do. So let's talk about at, at the game time. So you've come to the event, you were good boys and girls, you came at 6.44, you're, you're in the door, now what? Uh, so what you don't want to do, and you know, here's another life experience to make you feel better. We had an awards dinner for LAVA, 250 people, all the VCs have to show up, we, we break their arms. And I had a client come, and I look in the corner as I'm talking to other people, and he's got his tablet out, and he has a VC pinned to the wall, no joke, with the tablet in his face, giving him a 15 minute demo. I could have killed him. I pulled him aside and I said, you cannot do that to this guy. He doesn't, that isn't what you do with networking. Do not do the 15 minute presentation. The idea is to get in and get out. So what I'm gonna do with Kay is I'm gonna walk up to her and I'm gonna shake her hand and I'm gonna do what I call the Bill Clinton. I'm gonna look her in the eye and the whole room disappears. You are the most important person on the planet Earth for the next 30 seconds. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shake her hand, I'm gonna introduce myself very briefly. So, not the long version, the short version. Hi, I'm Matt Crowley, I'm on the board of the LA Venture Association, I'm glad you came to this LAVA event. What brought you here today? 
And then she's going to tell me that she came here to meet investors. And I'm going to say, well, tell me about what you do. And she's going to tell me about her company. And then at that point, I'm going to say, that's really interesting. And you might want to meet Bob over in the corner. Um, make sure I said hi and he'll pay attention. And then I'm going to ask if you have a business card. And I'm going to say, thank you. And I'm going to slow down. I'm going to actually look at your business card instead of just stuffing it in my pocket. Because I want her to feel really important. And to know that I actually paid attention. You're not just another person at this event. I really did want to meet you. I want to make a connection. Why? Because I intend to invite her to coffee. So coffee is the time for the horrible tablet to come out. <laughs> not, not, while she's trying, not while she's trying to meet another 20 people. Not cool. So if we're smart about the way we network, you get in, you get to know the other person, you slow down, you don't do like uh, millennials do at the barn and look over her shoulder to see if there's someone hotter here uh, that might have money. She's the only one here and I'm focused on her. And I want to make sure that she's receptive when I reach out for coffee. And then as soon as I'm done with her, I'm moving on to Johnny. And when I'm done with Johnny, I'm moving on to Henry. And I'm going to try and meet everybody. Now, one thing you have to understand is talking about the post game show, these are not baseball cards. You, you're not trying to collect a bunch of Mickey the, the, the only The only value of this card is if I actually follow through. If I don't bother to follow through and I have a stack of 20, all I've done is clutter my office. So I have failed. I might as well have not even gone to the networking event if I can't be bothered to follow up with you. So you've got to follow up. And what that means is part of your pre-game planning is that you need to look at Outlook before you go to the event. Look at your calendar. And if you're going away to Mexico for the next three weeks, you can't go to a networking event the day before. Because what's going to happen? You're going to say, we really ought to have coffee. And then she's not going to hear from you for four weeks. You're like, the hell was that? So obviously, you weren't that interested in meeting me. And she may not even remember, and she'll just ignore my email. So I failed again. So I need to make sure that I've got room. Don't go to a networking event if you do not have time to network. Make sure that you have time to know. So that's important. Um, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, I, I have an allergic reaction. There's someone in here who's doing insurance. It's DNO insurance, which is quite interesting to me. But life insurance and car insurance, if I meet somebody like that, I have trouble controlling my face and go, because I can't help you. And you can't help me. I'm not sure why we're even at the same event. What, what are you doing here? Um, so, but you have to be very careful. And sometimes somebody will have a physical appearance that's kind of schlumpy, um, to use the Latin. And you think, well, I, I, you know, that person can't help me. What if that's an accountant? I love accountants. But they kind of are a little schlumpy. And so if that, was the, if that was the accountant that happens to have 10 Pasadena angels as his clients, oh, crap. We, we let his appearance distract us from meeting him, and we could have had bulk cool introductions. So you want to try to gently meet everybody who's here. Um, so I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, so those, those are some of the, the, uh, the big magic tricks. Um, so now we've, we've got our pre-game, we've got our post-game. One other part of the pre-game is trying to understand Okay, well, thanks for saying Lava. We, we understand Innovate Pasadena, but how the heck do I find other venues where I ought to be? Uh, you're in the lucky period. If it was 10 years ago, I would have said, well, uh, there's one outlet that I know of that has a calendar function. These days, there are multiple ones. The one that's my personal favorite uh, is uh, socaltech.com. Uh, ben Quo out in Westlake Village he has a daily email that goes out. It's free. And he sends out a list of the stuff on his website. What deals got closed last week? Who's looking for hires? Some advertisements. And then at the bottom is a calendar function where he lays out stuff. I, I think I'm reasonably well plugged into the community. He always has events I've never heard of. So there will be a geek dinner or a twist up or some other thing you know, to use the, the 
organization that hasn't existed 10 years, but it's a great thing. Um, but uh, you know, looking at calendar functions will help you think about where you want to be. Um, there's uh, also Built in LA has a calendar, and there are a couple others specifically for Silicon Beach and also uh, for the rest of us that don't live in Silicon Beach. Like, I'm in Encino, you're in Pasadena. There are places other than uh, Silicon Beach to go. Uh, downtown actually has a pretty vibrant uh, startup community these days. So I'd be looking at calendars, seeing where there are events that, that you could go to. Um, so uh, let me talk briefly uh, about what happens if you actually get a fish on the hook. So this is the part that you're all hoping for. Uh, so you, when you go to a VC panel, like what we do at Lava, and you stand in line with the 20 people, uh, what's normally going to happen is you're going to rush up and say, I have an app that cures cancer, and here's my business card. And you're really excited because the VC actually takes your business card. He does a bill plan. He looks you in the eye and he says, well, you know, I, you have a line of 30 people buying it, but tell me the 30-second version. So you tell him, and God bless him, it's going to be a him. Sorry. We, we haven't evolved as venture capital folks. It's very rare to learn. Got to fix that. Uh, but he's going to then say, well, here's my card, and you should call me. Okay. And you get all excited, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Well, no. Uh, what's going to happen to 99% of you is that card's going to go into the wastebasket. Uh, you're going to have to follow up. Please don't be a stalker. Uh, so you can, you, can, you can call them once. He's probably not picking up the phone. You can email him and say, hey, you know, really enjoyed meeting you, and no. We're not sending the 80-page business plan. Nobody wants to read that. Not even your friends and family want to read that. It's a good exercise for you to figure out your assumptions, but nobody wants that. At best, what you do is you send a seven to eight page PowerPoint deck. And Jim Andelman at Rincon Ventures is always kind enough to be on our panel. And he always says, PowerPoints, it's like VC crack. It's as the email comes and he sees the PowerPoint, his fingers starts twitching, and, and he has to click because he, he just has to. So they will probably look at your PowerPoint. The ones that are kind will send you an email back that will have two sentences in it saying, thanks, but you know if you'd have looked at my website, pre-game plan, you would have understood that I don't invest in water technology. We only invest in blockchain. Why did you send this to me? And so he's being polite, even though you just got face plan. The ones that are less polite, you won't hear the thing. And you'll send another email, and another email, and another email. And unfortunately, he will now know who you are, but not for the reason that you want it. You, you are the stalker. So what I always encourage my clients is, if you're going to do the email, send an email not within the hour, but let a day go by, sort of like dating. Don't, don't call 10 minutes after you met the person. And then let a couple days go by. At the end of the week, email again saying just following up. And then you need to go dark for a while. And sometimes no doesn't mean no, it means not right now. And so what you might do is once a quarter, send an update. So not saying, would you please for the love of God give me a coffee? No, instead what you do is say, you know, it was nice meeting you at the time we met. All I had was a prototype. Now that three months have gone by, now I have 100 users in an open beta. So not sure if that's more interesting to you, but wanted to just give you that update. And then the next time you say, we actually raised 500K worth of angel money and just wanted to let you know. And then at some point the light bulb might go off because you de-risked your company enough that it's not so scary that you won't invest. If you actually get the coffee, then what will happen is this is not the time to do the 80-page PowerPoint. Nobody wants to see that either. What he wants to do is to just listen to you for 20 minutes and get a sense of how real you are. And he probably has two or three questions in mind that are showstoppers, and he wants to see if you're going to get past that first hurdle. You may never hear from him again after the coffee. But hey, at least you got some feedback this time instead of dead silence. If you get past the coffee, 
the next step is he's going to invite you to the office and a couple people, they might not be decision makers, they might just be entrepreneurs and residents that understand your industry, and you'll be asked to do a 30 to 40 minute version. You don't wanna turn the lights off, you don't wanna do a 50 page PowerPoint, instead you do like a 20 page PowerPoint, and then you have others in your briefcase. So if they wanna ask deeper about finance, you pull that one out. If they wanna ask about your R&D roadmap, you pull that one out. But you try to respect the audience and not hit them with every last thing that you think they need to make the decision. Uh, and one phrase I always use, and this resonates through all of it, is you're never going to get checks over chicken wings. So when you go to an investor event, you have to put into your head, I, I am not going to get a check today. I might get a meeting today, and that would be a home run. So don't push an investor so hard that you turn them off by telling them in desperation every last thing you think they need to know. Same thing at that meeting, three steps down the road. Let's, let's try to give them enough information to keep them on the hook, keep the conversation moving, because it, much like dating, no one's getting married in the first month. Most people don't, I don't know. Uh, but it's probably going to be a six to nine month journey to get to the place where a venture capital firm would invest. Uh, an angel investor, which is a different breed, they might move more quickly, but they're also very thoughtful people. It's how they got their money, being thoughtful, being careful, being process oriented. So the, the good angels are not going to race to the finish line to sign a check. They're going to want to do diligence on you. Talk to customers, talk to vendors, talk to your employees, and then they'll invest. Now, phone call, coffee, meeting. You may never hear from them again after the meeting. That's possible. Or they may keep track of you. Understand that there are different versions of who works inside the venture capital firm. So sometimes my clients will get very excited and they'll say, oh my God, a person from such and such VC firm called. They say, that's really great, who was it? And they'll tell me and I won't know the name. And then I'll say, let me just check on the web. And I see, oh, it's an associate. So junior MBAs that come out of school and are lucky enough to get hired by a VC, they are not decision makers. If they have associate in their title, those guys are out there scanning the field to see who might be interesting to their bosses. Those are good people to talk to, be very respectful, because that's the front, the front door guard. That person will listen to you, ask a lot of questions, get to know your company, and then he's going to feed that up to his boss. When the, the partner calls, that's when you're now with someone that might be capable of recommending the firm writes a check. So try to contain your, curb your enthusiasm. Uh, but it's a good, a good place to start. Now, if you get past the meeting and you have another meeting and another meeting, the final step will be when the VC is now prepared to hand you a term sheet. When you do not offer a term sheet, you do not offer a letter of intent, it's, it will make you look like a bumpkin. Um, it's not how the process works. You're gonna feel desperate and think, why does no one think my baby is pretty? Maybe I'll draft my own term sheet since no one will give me one. Don't do that. It, it will damage your, your perception by investors. They have to come to you with the investment. They're going to ask you how much you're raising, what valuation are you looking at, what percentage of the company are you going to give away, what terms are you offering. All of that stuff sounded scary. It's in the book. Come to the first time entrepreneur class. We'll teach you all about it. But that would be the next stage. And uh, for the love of all that is holy, do not try to negotiate term sheets on your own. This is the time to spend a couple of bucks and have a lawyer help you out. Um, you know, even with the book, even with the first time entrepreneur training, you'll understand the lingo, but as to what's market will be harder. So that would be a place to go get help. So now we've talked about pre-game, during the game, and post-game. So that's what I got for you, but happy to do questions. Matt Powell, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and perspective on uh, uh, how to network and connect with uh, venture capitalists. And it does seem to be a, a different model uh, that between that and, and angel investors, and I think it's really important to make those distinctions. And also really great advice on how to just empathically connect with other people during those networking events, because you never know 
who they might know and they can connect you through the grapevine to someone that you actually really need, which is what we try to do here too. So that's all around great advice. We're gonna open up to Q&A now. If you have questions, raise your hand. John, walk around with the mic. If you'd like to share a story, please save it for offline. Will you hang out with us a little bit afterwards? You can dump on them later, but not right now, okay? <laughs> Matt, that was terrific, thank you. Question, how important is it to have a fundable CEO? <laughs> uh, so that's actually a really important point she just raised. That was an awesome softball, thank you. Um, so when uh, you listen to the VCs on one of these panels, the, they'll tell you about all the things that they like when it comes to what <coughs> startup will they invest in, what won't they invest in. So first thing is, Nobody wants to invest in your lifestyle business. If you're gonna run it for more than five to 10 years, that confuses the investor. They don't know how they're ever gonna get out. A lot of them will use this tired phrase, we always invest in the jockey, not the horse. And what they're trying to communicate in 1940 terms is we, your idea may be awesome. You may have an app that cures cancer, but unless you have a team that can fully build it out and actually get someone to buy the app that cures cancer, this isn't a business. This is either a science experiment or a hobby. So they really do care who's on your team. And uh, several years ago at one of our VC panels, we had a, a young lady get up and she asked the ultimate question. She said, well, if you only invest in people that you know or that have long pedigrees, because they've worked at a bunch of companies, and I'm just starting out, I'm 23, does that mean that you'll never invest in me? And the whole crowd, you could have heard a pin drop. And <clears throat> the guy said, probably not. And he said that as VCs, the jockeys that they like are people that were CEO, CTO, CFO, EIEIO for prior companies <laughs> that they had invested in and did well. They know those people. They have a track record. If you're not that, it's going to be harder. If you're able to at least get a soft introduction, your accountant, your lawyer, your banker, your somebody uh, knows the VC and that person has passed on other leads that that VC liked the taste of, maybe that gets you a little higher up in the food chain. So now all of you are looking very puzzled, thinking, oh crap, I'm never going to get VC money. That may be true, uh, but he did. she was bold enough to ask the next question. So is there any way at all that you would ever invest in me? And being pithy, he said two words. He said, hire well. And what he meant by that was, I may have no experience that raises me into one of those two layers that Jim's looking for, but if I can hire the ex biz dev guy from Google or the former whatever of Yahoo, uh, then my team becomes more credible. So as you're looking for partners, rather than your college drinking buddy, you might look for somebody that's a little bit more of a mercenary and they have some street cred because they've been in other VC back companies. Fantastic question. Next one's over here. Okay, I want to throw a ball back to you. Uh, I actually getting lots of calls from different uh, investors uh, because what I do, and I think most of them are not actually they are serious. They actually turn out to be true. So, I uh, want to question is how to screen if someone call and wants to work with me or on investments and see if they are serious or maybe workable. That is another fantastic question. So, as startups, you're always thinking about being on defense that the investor is gonna come and they're gonna to wanna to know your story. You should also do diligence on the investors and understand their story. I always talk about in the entrepreneur program, there's cheap money and there's expensive money. Expensive money is I have an app that cures cancer and I talk to my next door neighbor who's a dentist who has a couple bucks and he wants to play in the casino. That guy, he will write a $100,000 check and that's lovely, but his 100,000 is gonna be usually expensive because he's gonna keep coming to me with brilliant ideas about we should have an app that cures tooth decay. Okay, that's really nice, but we're over here doing cancer. And 
then he's going to come back to me and say, well, you know, that 100000 I gave you six months ago, I didn't tell my wife, and she kind of wants it back. Well, dude, I already spent the money. So, no. Oh. So that's expensive money. So you need to understand, does this investor understand this space? Have they played in this space? But more importantly, are they cheap money? Cheap money is money that not only understands your space, but the investor wants to help. So if I'm doing the water company and I've got somebody uh, from a utility that's a former CEO that wants to invest, I'm liking that one. Because he's got a Rolodex that's 100 times better than mine. And I'm keenly interested in having him on tap. Uh, I'm <clears throat> sorry. See, Dylan, I do this to everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if, if just because he has a Rolodex doesn't mean he's going to use it. So you'd like to know if he's made other investments. And then call those CEOs and find out, so was this guy a bully in the boardroom? Because he's being an awful sweet night now. But if he's going to be a jerk when he gets in and thinks he owns me, that's a horrible investor. That's expensive. If he's going to be helpful and take my calls, sometimes they won't call you back. Um, even though you have their money. What the heck is that? But if they are actually are responsive and they are willing to help you, that's a great investor. Now, as to how you figure that out, you kind of have to be gentle, but at the same time firm, and ask them. So, you know, if it's your first time out raising funds, you're going to be, geez, I really don't want to get into this guy's shorts and ask him a bunch of questions that make him think that maybe he's not good enough for me. But if he's a sophisticated investor, he should know why you're asking and be good, glad that you're asking this. Because most times when you raise your first round or two, it's not going to be one guy or one firm. It's going to be a syndicate. So, if I'm raising 100000 from you for a million dollar round, what's my issue? I need to go find another 900 k And as an investor, you would like to know, who am I in bed with here? And what, who are these other investors? And what do they bring to the table? And why did you get that lady to invest? And so if you're asking these kind of diligence questions of me, you're probably doing that for the other investors. And that shows me you're smart, and you're paying attention, and that you're only going to get value out of money. So for you, I think you're going to have to do a little bit of polite questioning of these investors when they come to you. So you can give them the elevator pitch, but then the you know after they've asked 10 minutes of question, next thing you're going to do is say, so tell me about you and tell me a little bit about the kind of investments you make. And if the answer is none, click. If the if the or unless you need expensive money, in which case you do unnatural things and do what you have to do. But if, if you have room and you have a million and a half dollars worth of interest for a million dollar round, then you can kind of pick and choose. And so you should be asking those questions. Very good question. Back here? Yeah. I run a cause-oriented company. Okay. Are there places to find angels and VCs that are interested in money and mission? So in my world, we call that social entrepreneurship. Uh, and there's uh, plenty of that. In 2012, California passed a law that allowed for benefit corporations. And for those that are in this space, it's a little confusing. There's B Corps and benefit corporations. They're very different animals. B Corp is a seal of approval, like uh, United Labs or Consumer Reports or whatever, that says B Labs has looked at you, you have paid them a fee, and you met their standards on what it is to be a social company, you can put our logo up there. Benefit Corporation means you comply with the statute. And the, the quick take on this is, uh, if I, I'm a for-profit company, I have a car wash, but I also want to do some good things. And I agree that I'm going to hold myself to uh, a green environmental standard. And as long as I do that, then I can market myself as a benefit. For you, um, LA, at least when I looked at this a couple of years ago, we were actually a sponsor of, um, of uh, Hub 101, and they have a nice community there. You might check them out. But the, the community here in LA is very nascent. So there are some people that play, but they're very hard to find. They're not well organized. Um, you're going to have to go to the bank. 
and the Bay has a, a couple of uh, really large, sophisticated conferences. So I think you got to get on Southwest. Other questions? Two more over here. Sure. Hi, can you talk about the different stages because they have changed so much. I I just yesterday heard Super C as a description of a round. Can you talk about what the rounds are, about how much each one is expected to be, sure. who you should be going for, and also if it if there's any value or disvalue to leapfrogging a round, just going straight to the next one. So uh, here's a way to cheat. Somewhere around page 142-ish, there's a chart in the book called Venture Lifecycle Chart, and, and it will give you some basic rules of thumb. So the quick take on this, she's asking about investment rounds. So most companies, you know, you keep using crack, I, I guess it's the opioid thing in my brain. Um, they, once you start taking venture capital, it's very, very hard to stop. And here's why. So the, the first round is usually called the, uh, the seed round or the family and friends or less politely the friends and fools round. And, and the idea here is that I have an idea, I've got a horrible prototype that breaks 90% of the time. I'd only like it to break half the time. So I, I'm gonna raise money from the dentist, from Uncle Ralph, uh, from the guy in the cubicle next to me. And I'm gonna try and raise 250 to 500 grand. That'd be a decent seed round. And that money is to get me to where my prototype, like I said, only breaks half the time. Then, and so it could be anywhere from 250 to a million. Uh, it used to be that you would only do friends and family in that seed round. Uh, now we're seeing the rise of micro VCs. So venture capital firms, they also have investors. And what they do is they'll go to CalPERS, CalSTRS, Bank of New York, and they'll go raise money. And they'll tell those guys, look, CalPERS, you know, it's a funny joke that you're gonna have eight and a half percent <coughs> returns every year. You only get seven. So you're, I, you're investing billions of dollars. My fund won't move the dial very much, but I could do 14, 20% returns compounded <coughs> over 10 years. Give me a little slice of that. And so they'll give them 10 million and this guy will give them 10 I have a hundred million dollar fund. So there needs to be a large enough amount of money that they can play with it and place large enough bets. Over the last five years, we've seen micro VCs that will go to family offices and say, you're not gonna give me 10 million, but give me a million. And so now I have 10 million worth of cash to play with. So I can't do a $2 million round that, that eat up half my fund. So instead, I'm going to do 250, 500. So you might see micro VCs play at that stage, but they're going to want a big honking chunk of equity to do a seed round because there's so much risk. So the more rounds you do, the more you de-risk it, which means the value can go up and the investor's money gets less stock. I teach this in the class, but the very, very quick version, I'm going to do this in about a minute, and then you're welcome to come. Um, the, the seed round, 250, 500, friends and family. Now that we built the prototype, we need to get it out into the wild to test it on a beta. We might raise another million or two in the Series A round. Once it's gone into the wild, and we're actually now getting somebody to pay for it, we need some rocket fuel to grow. It. And so we might do a five to $10 million B round. And then past that, if we need money to go public, or at least threaten to go public to force uh, one of our competitors to buy us, uh, then we're going to do a Series C round, and we could raise 10 to 20 million. If we're snap, we might do a D and E and F, but usually at around the C round, that's when you're going to get bought. Um, Last question. Yeah, sir. Good morning, Matt. I'm singing Steve. Okay. Good morning all to you. Oh, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not singing back. I've been told not to sing in public. Okay, you can still be the baritone. Um, anyway, I did some advertising for somebody, an advertising agency hired me to do equity crowdfunding. <laughs> I was able to raise $1.3 million wow. in a $7,000 ad spend on Facebook, wow. but I really didn't understand it. And now you just talked about seed round, and this was like another seed round, but they had already created the product, they had already gotten yeah, there. So what the heck is equity crowdfunding? Yeah, exactly. And how does that fit into getting a VC later? 
Is that gonna is that is that gonna be expensive money or cheap money in general? That that is a fantastic ending question. Thank you for that. Uh, so the it was, it was Obama, the jobs program. Right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, crowdfunding, two flavors of ice cream. Uh, one flavor of ice cream is uh, is uh, Kickstarter, which I don't know if you all listen to podcasts, but there's this podcast called Built, uh, How I Built This on NPR. The Kickstarter guy was on that. We were listening to that guy in the car yesterday. Um, what a goof. He, he made money in spite of himself. But anyway, back to the question, sorry. Uh, Kickstarter wants to do, I'm gonna do a board game, and if you wanna buy a board game early, give me some money. If you want an autograph version of the board game, give me some more money. That's that's not equity crowdfunding, but it is crowdfunding. So it really it's people buying product in advance and getting chachis. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is I'm gonna sell stock to Homer Simpson on a website through a crowdfunding platform. So I'm actually giving him a slice of my business. And there's a lot of security rules around it. You gotta be very careful how you do it. I have been coaching my clients. We can do that if you really wanna do it, but uh, you're gonna get expensive money because it's it's literally gonna be Homer Simpson. He's gonna be your investor. He won't know what the hell your product does, but he knows he wants to be in a casino. And so he will buy a, a small slice of your company. Now you won't necessarily have to interact with Homer directly. On a crowdfunding platform, what happens is we're gonna offer a million dollars worth of stock for 10% of our company, just kind of throw a dart at the wall. And so Homer will buy a slice of another entity. And all the people that invest in the crowdfunding will own a slice of that. And that entity owns a slice of my company. That doesn't mean that Homer understands any of this. So he may be calling me, curious. And he also has bright ideas. Would you like to invest in my snowplow company? Great episode. Uh, so, uh, you know, no. Uh, but you're gonna have, you're gonna, if you desperately need a million dollars, you can't find it any other way other than robbing a bank. You know, maybe that's the way to do it. I always think, you know, if you can't raise any money and you have to rob a bank, Maybe there's a message in, from the market about your product. You might want to think about that first before you go raising money from crazy people. But uh, well, how your second part of that question was, okay, that's how crowdfunding works. We, we get it now. Um, if, uh, if we do raise a million dollars that way, does that change my investability for later rounds? And so uh, I think it really is gonna depend on the VC, which is sort of a crappy lawyer answer, but to, to get a little deeper into it, there there are VCs that have experience with that, they're okay with it, they're glad that you raised the money to get to the point where you're de-risk. And again, they're thinking about who's on your team as opposed to, you know, what VCs are used to meeting crazy people from the seed round in the Series A. It won't be the first time in their lives they've met Uncle Phil. Um, this just won't be your uncle, it'll be Phil. Um, but he'll still be nuts. So they're they're used to that. That isn't going to cause them a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth, I would think. But there are older school VCs that are going to think, you know, why did you inflict that on yourself? And and does that mean that you really you really couldn't find any other sophisticated investors? You did that. That makes me think you're riskier. So you know, again, it's all about risk versus greed, right? Chevron, no risk, love. Them risk you all day and night. I need to get more for me to invest. Can they do another round of another seed round? Could you do could you do more crowdfunding? Uh, it's like crap, sure. The 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 deal is always on the corner. So I'll get to the crowdfunding platform is happy to have your business. So anyway, um, I don't want to keep you guys too long. We're gonna stick around. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.